this morning, just before I was leaving to come here, I received a phone call from Paula Estel, one of our church members that many of you know. Her and her husband, Jean's son, was killed in a car accident late last night, early this morning. She didn't want me to ruin anybody's Easter, but we're a family here at Westminster, and we need to be in prayer for Paula and Jean this morning. So let us, let us be in prayer now. Let us pray. God of resurrection, God of new life, God of light that shines in the darkness. We ask that you you be with us now as we celebrate one empty tomb and are mindful of those who are mourning at their own tombs. We ask that you be with us and that you be with Paula and Jean in their time of need and in their time of mourning. And that you bless it all. And that you keep us ever mindful that life does not end in death. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I used to think that Easter was this big celebration of unfettered joy, that no matter what was going on in our lives or in the world around us, that Easter was the one day a year where we could just just forget about it, maybe pretend it wasn't there and just celebrate joy, that God wins, that, that Christ is risen, that all is right in the world, even if it's just for this one day, that it's this unfettered dance of joy when it comes to Easter. It's a celebration of newness and of recreation, that it's a time that we celebrate the triumph of life over death. It's the one day a year where all concerns can just be laid aside and we can embrace the joy of living and the joy of our God and joyously sing our hearts out. And I still think that. I still think that we celebrate all of that today. But that isn't all we recognize at Easter. All is not celebration for us today. All is not happy today. Today there are people in pain. Today there are people who suffer tragic losses, whether or not today is Easter. And unfortunately, we've had a harsh reminder of that reality, finding out that Eric, at age 24, I think, has been taken from us so suddenly. Only recognizing the joy of Easter may not fully grasp its full meaning. In 2010, I was serving two churches in rural Virginia. One of them was kind of the mother church. It had the most people, and that means that it had 40 people who were devoted in there regularly every Sunday, and they had known each other going back for generations and generations. It was Monday, Thursday, and I just outlined my Easter sermon about how Easter is all joy, all this unfettered dance of joy, and I was preparing for a community Monday, Thursday service that evening when I received a phone call like I did this morning, that Harrison Davis, at age 26, was found dead in his apartment suddenly. Harrison was just a few years younger than me at the time, and like Eric, he had grown up in that church, and that church, much like this one, was more than just a church, it was a family. So like here, everyone had lost a son when Harrison had died, and his funeral was scheduled to be on Easter afternoon. How was I supposed to stand up in front of that church and preach about unending joy? And they'll go bury one of their children that same afternoon. 
we held fast to that Easter. Instead of cheerfully saying he is risen, we, we shared tears and hugs. We quietly clung to one another and, and prayed, and we longed for an empty tomb when we knew we would be filling one that afternoon. In moments in like that, and in moments like the one that we're having today where many of us are reeling from hearing that, that Eric has died, it can be really hard to see where God is in any of it. God can seem hidden at best, and in sometimes in moments like this, God can seem completely gone. And so it drives us back into the text this morning because, because what we need to do in moments like these is look deeply into the scripture story about the resurrection and see what, if anything, God has to say to us about any of this. And when we do that, I think, I think what we realize is what John is saying here about the Easter moment and about life itself is that it isn't all just joy and celebration like I wanted to think or until recently fully believed. John is telling us something here about the Easter moment and about life itself that is deeply profound, something more profound than I really even imagined, to be honest with you. Let's let's look closely at this. Mary comes to the tomb in the garden. And it's still dark out. Maybe the birds are are just beginning to chirp. And it's that time in between. It's not yet morning. But it's no longer night. It's not let light out. But it's not completely dark either. And imagine shock and horror she must have felt going to the grave of someone she dearly loved and seeing that it had just been vandalized and the body had been stolen. She didn't know yet. No one understood what was happening. She runs and goes, gets Peter and another disciple, and they don't understand either, and they just go home. They just leave. They just leave with her. But Mary stood outside weeping, John tells us. There isn't any celebration. There isn't any other joy here. She's terrified. She's horrified. She's crushed just when things couldn't get any worse, they did. I imagine it's about the worst thing that Mary could have possibly pictured happening if she could have even pictured it at all. Thursday, a close friend betrays the man she loves. Friday, all hope in the world was beaten and tortured and brutally killed. And then Sunday, she comes to the tomb trying to mourn his loss, and someone had desecrated his tomb and stolen the body. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine going to the grave of someone you love and find that it's dug up and the body's gone? And now, and now she's left alone with her tears, weeping outside of a tomb for a man that she loved, for a man that brought such beauty into the world, a man who was taken well before his time. John doesn't tell us what she's thinking here. We can only imagine, but I bet she's wondering where God is in any of this. I can see her asking over and over again, why, 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 to no answer. And I imagine the darkness of this moment overshadows just about anything else that's going on in the world around. And yet it's in this moment that it happens. She looks into the tomb one more time in disbelief, and that's when it happens. Two remarkable things happen. God chooses her, and then God speaks to her. 
These angels could have gone to anyone. They could have hit up the disciples when they were there or met them on the road on the way going back. The angels could have announced it to the multitudes and to the presses of the time. They could have rubbed the news into the face of the Pharisees. They could have shouted it from the mountaintops for all the world to hear, but they don't. God chooses the woman who is in mourning. The one who stays behind. The one who is in perhaps the most pain that Easter morning. The one who felt the greatest pain. The one who wept the hardest is the one to see Christ first. What a powerful, powerful statement that is about this God in Christ that we, that we serve and celebrate this morning. John, in his gospel, is telling us that Easter is both suffering and joy, that it's sorrow and celebration, that it's life and death and life again. He sets us up from this, from the very beginning. Listen to how he opens his gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him is life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome that. You see that there? It's light and darkness. It isn't that the darkness goes away. But despite that darkness, Despite the suffering and sorrow, despite the hardship, despite death, the light still shines. The light shines in the darkness no matter what, cannot overcome it. John sets us up for this moment at the empty tomb from the very beginning. And it's right when it seems like the darkness has won, that Mary is at the tomb and it's neither morning nor light, it's neither light nor dark, and all bets are off. Things could go either way, and the world hangs in the balance. And it's here in that moment then that the light bursts forth again and Jesus dances on this world once again. What an amazing reason to celebrate this morning. I mean, maybe Easter isn't all joy and celebration. Maybe Easter is reminding us to meet those suffering at their tombs, whether they're literal or figurative tombs. Maybe what Easter is telling us to do is to affirm yes despite no's, that yes, there's suffering and joy, that yes, there are tears and laughter, yes, there's sorrow and hope, yes, there's light, there's darkness and light. But always light. No matter what, there's light. And though it may not always be easy to see, the great hope and promise of Easter is that light. The light that shines in the darkness. The light that the darkness cannot overcome. The light of Christ who dances on this world once again. The great yes and amen to it all. Christ, the light of the world the light that we're all asked to be to those who are weeping at their tombs. What greater cause for celebration can there be than to be the light of the world, to show those who suffer in our midst that God is with them no matter what? What more powerful message is there than telling them that we'll walk with them and that we'll carry you until you can dance with joy again? What greater Easter can we ask for when we're truly shown that our light, the light God gives us, can shine through the darkness for others? And so I want to say to you this morning that that if you're sitting here among us and life hasn't been perfect, if some mornings it's just hard to get up and even face the day, if life hasn't worked out how you would ever hoped or imagined, if you've ever lost somebody close to you and the pain is too much, 
or if the bills are stacking up and you feel buried. Or maybe you thought the bullies of this world stayed in the schoolyard, but it turns out they don't. Or if the wells of love that you once felt have feel as though they've drawn, dried up. Or if you're sitting here asking yourself why you're even here when it feels like God has all but abandoned you. If you're reeling with me at the loss of someone so young and so suddenly like we lost Eric. If you, like Mary, are asking yourself where God could be in any of this, what you need to know this Easter morning, what God is trying to tell us this Easter morning is that this, this is our God. Our God is the God of the little people, of the lepers, of the tax collectors, of the prostitutes. This this is the God of the doubters and of the deniers and of the heartbroken and of the hurting. This God is a God that was broken with us and broken for us. This is the God that meets you, weeping beside the tomb when everything seems lost. Easter is Christ's promise to us that he'll never leave us. This is the God that's there for you. Because Easter is Christ's promise that he'll never leave us. And so when we do things together, like when we gather around this table and we break bread and we pour the cup, no one is forgotten. No one, no one is left out. No one, no one is denied access. Because light beats darkness. Because love beats hatred. Because grace beats sin. And the God that we worship here doesn't leave you abandoned. But when all else seems lost, that's when God suddenly shows up. And maybe we don't always know it, and maybe we don't always recognize it. After all, Mary thinks that she's seeing the gardener. Maybe he has dirty hands instead of white robes, but God shows up because it's in the moment of greatest suffering that the biggest miracle happens. It's when all hope was lost that new life springs forward. It's when everything seems at its worst that God then does something new. Easter isn't the denial of human suffering while we put on a fake smile. Easter is the celebration of hope despite all that we've lost, despite all that we've been through, despite all of our pain. It's the yes in face of the no. It's yes, there's suffering and there's joy. Yes, there's tears and there's laughter. Yes, there's sorrow and hope. Yes, there's darkness. And there's light. But there's always light. No matter what, there's always light. Easter is God's promise to us that this too shall pass. Easter is Christ broken with you, emerging whole for you. Easter encompasses the entire human experience and reminds us that life doesn't end in death, that darkness doesn't beat the light, that hatred can't kill love, and that apathy can't murder hope. Because no matter what, no matter what, God is with us. So may you go looking to the breaking of a new day. 
may you go and discover that the tomb is empty and meet the gardener. May you go knowing that even in your greatest pain or loss, Christ is there. And may you go proclaiming with all of your heart that Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah.